Good morning and thank you. So I guess I'll start with answering the question. Um, so every year we have to one up what we did the prior year. So a couple years we built rockets and we shot them up in rockets and tried to do that. Last year we used, any of you know what tannerite is? Um, we used too much and um, we ended up with a peep residue everywhere, uh, but it made it a lot of fun. So I, don't, I have not thought about what we're going to do this year. So if you have ideas, um, I'm all ears. I've got a few weeks to figure this one out. But I wanna start um, by just telling you a little bit about me because this will, this will help as I talk about this theme right here. So as was mentioned, I, I've spent most of my career in Boston and New York, sorry, in, uh, in Portland. Um, I can't even remember where I lived. But uh, so recently moved here and I'm coming back, and what's been kind of fun is that I started my career in Provo years and years ago. And the very first presentation I did to a business audience was down in a hotel, Center Street in Provo, trying to convince people that they should have a website. This was in the, the very beginning of the dot-com boom. We were selling storefront software, and so it's like, hey, you need, you need to have a storefront, you need to have a website, and these were big companies that it was a novel idea. You can imagine that over the course of the last 20 plus years, marketing has changed just a tad, right? Back then, we didn't have most of the technology that we have today. And so, as I look back over the course of the last 20 years, one thing that I've noticed is, I can look to what I've learned in the past as guidance for what to do moving forward, but not as a recipe, right? Things are changing so quickly that you have to stop and say, what can I take from what worked last week or last year and try to figure out how to apply it to the problems that I have today? But I can't expect that I can just take what worked last week and that it's going to work next week. So we as marketers have to constantly adapt. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm going to share some thoughts on how we can, as marketers, be experimental. And as we are experimental, we can come up with new ways of doing marketing that intuitively we might think would fail. But very frequently, we'll find that we can succeed. So I'm gonna go through a few case studies. To help you understand, though, let me tell you a bit about where I am right now. So Lucid Chart, as was mentioned, a local company, we build a visual workspace product that really combines diagramming and data visualization and makes it so that you can visualize about any part of your business. Whether it's a business process or a sales process, you can visualize all sorts of things. And in visualizing it, you can then understand it. And as you understand it, you can figure out how to change it. Pretty straightforward. Our business model, on the other hand, is not straightforward. We have what I call a B to C to B squared business model. Let me explain. First of all, we've got B to C. So we have it, we're a SaaS business. And so every month we have 700,000 plus people that come to our website, register for our product. And our goal is to get them then to pay us, either as an individual or as a team. My team's responsible for that funnel all the way through down into payment. Next, we move into a B2B motion, where we look for ways that people are using the product. So we watch and we see someone hit this paywall or they had this sort of activity. And based on that, we then automate outreach to them and look for ways to, you know, to engage with them. If they respond, we hand it off to our sales team and our sales team will talk with them and we try to get them to use the product as an enterprise. So that's the, the first B2B part. The second B2B part is that we increasingly are building solutions for all sorts of different uh, types of activities within a company. So for instance, for sales teams, we've got the ability to help sales teams visualize the sales process. So there, we're going out and we're using very traditional B2B tactics to try to talk with sales leaders and work our way a bit more tops down. So we've got a pretty wide gamut of marketing activities that we are going through to try to pursue this business model. Very few companies have done what we're doing, and so we can't look to someone else and say, this, we should just copy them. Instead, we've got to do a whole lot of experimentation. So today what I want to walk you through are just a few ways that we've done experimentation. 
And mostly, rather than give you specific details on here's what you should experiment on, rather what I want to share are some principles that you can take and figure out how in your business you can imply, apply experimentation. A Little bit more context. Last year on our marketing team, we ran over 500 structured experiments. Now these aren't keyword buys or SEO pages. These are things where we had a specific hypothesis and we ran an experiment and then we measured the results and determined whether or not we should continue with that experiment. All of them were successful. To be clear though, half of them, or more than half of them had a failed result. But in getting that failed result, we learned something. So we see that as a win. We see that as a successful experiment. One of the key things with experimentation is recognizing that you are very often going to have a failed result, but in that failed result, you can learn something that will help you then to move forward. We've found that we have, we've seen all sorts of things that have come out of this, from very minor improvements to some pretty major breakthroughs in our marketing motion. So again, think of experimentation as a fundamental way that you actually do marketing, not just something that is, um, say, A-B testing. A-B testing is a tactic, but experimentation is a culture. And you've got to make sure that you instill within your marketing teams that culture of experimentation. So I'm going to walk through some specifics. This is case study one. This is our pricing page. So if you look at this pricing page, we have run hundreds of experiments on this pricing page. Now I know the first time I saw this, probably the very first thing that jumped out to me was that our basic tier over there, notice that the column isn't the same size as the rest. And I sent a note to the team, I'm like, you guys, this, is, this looks Bush League, what's going on? And it turns out it's that way because we ran tests and we found that the page performs better. We get more people over to pro if we have a column that is a little bit uh, smaller on basic. It's wonky, but we decided to keep it. Now I'll give you a different one where we, got, uh, where we saw something that we said, even though this one, we're not gonna do it. We also ran through an experiment where we said, let's try different names for basic. The one that outperformed by a mile was home. And we looked at that and we said, okay, it makes sense why. People look at that and they say, well, I'm in a business. I don't want home, I'm gonna go to pro. But we stepped back and we said, even though this likely would have led to hundreds of thousands of dollars of increased revenue, we thought that the long-term impact on our position in the market as a business tool would be minimized by having home. So in that case, we said, we're not going to implement that. So in all of these, there are some times where you say, wait a second, um, even though this seems like a successful experiment, maybe it's not the right thing to do. Let me show you a few other things on this page though. You'll notice that you've got different button colors. The button colors have all been tested. Uh, and as we test them, we try to figure out things like, is it a specific color? Is it a contrast ratio? What is it about that that is actually helping people to interact with the page the way that we would like them to interact? If you go over to the, the third column from the right under team, this is of course where we want to funnel a lot of people. We, uh, we are more successful as we have people use the product as teams. So we're trying to funnel people there. One thing that we found that was interesting, you see there's a drop down that says three users at a certain amount. One of the experiments we ran, it's actually a series of experiments, was basically looking at, is there elasticity in either team size or pricing or both? And what we found is that we very quickly hit a cap on the amount that people were willing to pay for a team subscription. However, we were able to drop the number of team members from five to three with no impact at all. So the price per license went up, but the aggregate amount didn't change. And so there are these sorts of experiments that as we've run through them, we're, we're starting to tease out interesting behaviors. Now what's been fun for us more recently is we put a lot of emphasis on international. So we have a large uh, funnel of Spanish users and many others, and what we find is that the behaviors are wildly different across different languages. 
And so we have to be careful about how we experiment and in, ensure that we are segmenting based on these languages to understand the dynamics that are different across the team. One note in all of this, uh, I'm lucky enough on my marketing team to actually have an embedded engineering team that helps with this. So beyond just having front end developers, we have part of our core engineering team sits within marketing and they are responsible for running experiments on this page and even deep into the product. Because we look at multiple measures. We look at are people registering, are they paying, and does our experiment actually affect product usage? So there are times where we will reach fairly deep into the product and toy with something there as well to see if we can change product usage in a particular way. So this is the pricing page. Lots and lots of experimentation that's happened there. I'm going to pull out one. This one, probably um, not the uh, best example for uh, marketers because it makes us look sometimes like marketers. But I, I, I thought this one was kind of fun. Have you all noticed that if you just rub a little AI on something, it, it gets better, right? That's all you have to do is just say there's some AI there. So someone on our team was reading an article about how all you have to do is say that a product has AI and people are more interested in it. And so we said, let's just see, uh, we're curious. Notice here, for each of these tiers, we have two product capabilities highlighted. In the context of the overall page, it's very, very small. I thought there's just no chance that we could affect anything by changing one of those. So we took that second one and it used to say data linking, which you can say is AI. Right? We went to our product team and said, is this defensible? They said, yes. We're like, okay, we'll, just, we'll try this. Any guesses what happened when we changed that to chart AI instead of data linking? What's that? So what happened is we saw 9% more people start to hover over those than before, and 9% increase in pro over basic, because we put that little thing that said chart AI. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go and put AI on everything. Rather, it's really interesting to see how very, very small things can have a pretty big impact on, on a page and performance. Next, let's go to a different principle, and that is that iteration often leads to success. Oftentimes what we do with A-B testing is we look at something very discreet. Most of the tests I just ran through were discrete tests. But let's talk about something that required us to look at something much more holistically and do a lot of um, iteration in order to test into something. So this was our homepage for a very long time. We all absolutely hated it for multiple reasons. I'll give you a few here in a second. But it, every test we ran, uh, just about every test that we ran, ended up failing, right? So as an example, across the top, we have what we call our Halloween nav bar. And we all hated it, but we would, we would change colors and it would fail because registrations would go down. We even saw that sometimes colors would affect uh, deep dock usage within the product. So we just, we could not get away from the Halloween nav bar. Similarly, you'll notice that throughout the page, it's very tactical. It talks about flowchart maker. And as we try to change the way that people perceive our brand, that's not exactly what we want. But every time we changed certain words, they would fail. So this was one of the most disappointing things on joining uh, Lucidchart. I found that the team was just completely dejected. Everything fails. We can't change the home page. It's just we're just stuck with this thing. So we stepped back and took a slightly different approach. We went to this growth team, the team that really focuses on experimentation, and said, help us understand how to structure our experiments in better ways so that we can get better tests. And we ran through a few steps here. The first is we needed to de-risk the experiment. Of course, our homepage was a pretty big deal. The homepage represents a huge portion of our traffic. And as you see on this page, it was clear that a large portion of the traffic coming to this page was for flowchart maker. So an important keyword for us, but not necessarily the keyword that we want people to associate with our brand. So we took several months and we systematically transitioned the SEO value of Flowchart Maker to another page. That de-risked this page. 
it allowed us to do experimentation without having to worry about that very, very important variable. Next, we said we need to understand the dynamics of this page. What on this page matters and what on this page does not? And that was by audience. So if you look above the fold, registration was paramount. So you know, we have a key value that as you come to our homepage, we want to make sure that we don't affect registrations. Below the fold, though, where maybe if I'm an analyst or an existing user or an executive at a company that uses Lucidchart, maybe I come to the page and I'm not interested in registering. I want to scroll down and understand more about social proof. Who else uses this product? What are the use cases? These sorts of things. So what we found is for registrations, we couldn't mess with above the fold a whole lot. But below the fold, we had near complete freedom to do whatever we wanted to do without affecting registrations. So we went systematically through this and discovered which portions of the page drove which behaviors. So this is where we ended up. We started testing. Now, I should say, this is where we ended up after the initial test. We continue to test and iterate. First of all, you'll notice that the Halloween nav bar went away. We were able to get rid of that because we started testing things below that that allowed for contrast. Because we had been testing that nav bar in isolation and not in conjunction with other changes, we were led to believe that it had to be orange. Turns out it didn't have to be orange. It just had to have contrast versus the other portions of the page. So in testing, we learned that important thing. We also learned some really interesting things about the image to the right. So you know, of course, the, the registration box was vitally important. That was one of the first things that we tested. But here on the right, we tested all sorts of images. We were wondering, as people come to the, uh, our homepage, what do they need to see? Just about any type of user within a company is a candidate for Lucidchart. Many are technical, but you, all, you have salespeople, you have marketers, you have operations people. And so we were wondering, what do we need to have there that speaks to that user that will cause them to register? And what we discovered is we needed something that helped quickly set in their mind an idea of what the product was, but without causing them to think too much about it. We found this by, for instance, if we took an image of a diagram and put it within the frame of a monitor, registrations went down. Our hypothesis is that people spent too much time staring at that monitor and trying to understand exactly what it was that diagram was trying to show them. So we started experimenting with things that were a bit more abstract, like this one, where it's a diagram, but it's not as overt. You'll notice in this case that it's grayed out we discovered that having it muted was actually better performing than having it highly saturated or even at a normal image rate. So it was more muted. We found that org charts outperformed others. Our hypothesis there, we don't know for sure, but our hypothesis is that people could at a glance say, oh, that's an org chart. And they didn't have to think a lot about it. There wasn't cognitive load. We tested, is it better to have photos there or not? And we found that having photos there dramatically outperformed an org chart that didn't have photos. We even started playing with, you see the little iconography next to it. That is actually representative of some of the advanced functionality of Lucidchart. We were curious, can we put it in there and is it going to make an impact? It did. So bit by bit, we were able to discover all sorts of things that we could do on this page that initially, was, you know, it's just nearly impossible. We couldn't get anything to win. But after we were able to step back and think of it as a holistic piece of real estate, rather than a bunch of discrete experiments, we, we were able to test our way into something that was much more effective. So very important to think of your experimentation holistically. The last example of experimentation I'm going to go through is very, very different. So, one of the challenges that we have with Lucidchart is that we see our market as about 1.2 billion knowledge workers. Right now we have 15 million users of the product. We've got a long way to go. Now the vast majority of people that are candidates to use the product would never think of themselves as diagrammers. So we've got to get in front of people that would not consider themselves diagrammers and get them to consider it. 
Now, we also run a highly, highly efficient business. We're not going to do Super Bowl ads. We're not gonna spend a ton of money on advertising that isn't uh, uh, high intent. So that was our challenge. We've got a product where you know, a bunch of people, when they hear the word diagramming, are immediately uh, going to sleep, but we need to get in front of them. So I'm gonna walk through how we experimented our way into what ended up being called last year the only advertising campaign that mattered. That's what Adweek called it. Um, and I'll tell you, this was a complete mistake, right? It, but it came out of this culture of experimentation. It started years ago. Um, so we've got, I've forgotten your name, your first name, Stoffer. Brandon. Brandon. So Brandon's older brother was the brainchild of a bunch of this that happened long before I joined uh, Lucidchart. It started with someone creating this chart of Hey Jude just having fun with it. And they said, you know what? What if we put this to music? And so they started a contest. Here's how this one went. Let's face it, flowcharts sound a little boring to, well, most people. So we asked, how do we give people a reason to pay attention? We wanted to create an attractive brand for Lucidchart that appeals to the broadest audience possible. In answer to these questions, the idea for the Songtacular Flowdown was born. We started by making a flowchart music video for one of the greatest songs of all time, Hey Jude by the Beatles. Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a to our surprise, people loved it. Before we knew it, we had 350,000 views on YouTube and a compelling way to showcase our intuitive flowchart software. People could experience Hey Jude like never before. And they weren't just watching Hey Jude come alive, they were watching our software in action. After this initial success, we decided to take it one step further. We turned eight popular songs into flowchart music videos and pitted them against each other in a bracket style competition we called the Songtacular Flowdown. Okay, so just a bunch of people having a little bit of fun. This one at the time, again, this was before I joined Lucidchart, we saw as a huge success with 400,000 views. And it led to this idea that every summer we would do some crazy creative project. The next one, the next summer, was basically to take a bunch of pop art and create flowcharts, right? So in this case, which, uh, which Star Wars character are you? And uh, so we created a bunch of these. They're pretty interesting, got written up all over the place, 3.2 million views of those. It worked fabulously until Reddit got upset over something and uh, we, we stopped getting Reddit credit for it. And so, uh, that idea started to, started to die off. So it came to the next summer. This was my first summer at uh, Lucidchart. And the team came forward with this idea. They said, let's do something big. Let, let's really go all in here. And let's go after a world record. Let's talk to Guinness. Let's, uh, let's try to do the largest diagram ever created. And the idea was that we would crowdsource this. Here's the way that we pitched it. Walter goes for a walk, and you decide what happens next. Maybe Walter strolls across Mars, and maybe he runs into Albert Einstein. So add your sentence to Walter's story, and help set a world record, the world's largest crowdsourced diagram. A giant choose-your-own-adventure story written by the internet. And you could even win $1,000. So click to add your sentence to Walter's story. So how do you think it went? Um, the internet is a nasty, nasty place. Um, we were prepared. Uh, we thought we were prepared for this. We had people prepared to do some filtering. We had technology prepared to do some filtering. Um, the UK in particular is a nasty, nasty place. Um, Walter did some pretty unspeakable things very, very fast. And this is one that it didn't take us very long before we said, Let's just call this as a, it was a, su a successful experiment. Horribly, horribly failed result. And so we pulled the plug on this, right? But we had sunk quite a lot of time and energy into trying to get this campaign off the ground. At the same time, something else was happening. One of our engineers uh, 
was into, it, he's totally into memes on the internet. And he came to our creative team and he said, what if we use Lucidchart to explain some of the crazy memes that are out there on the internet? Specifically, have you ever seen all of the words that are used on the internet to explain dogs? I don't know about you, I had never seen this. But his idea was, let's use Lucidchart to help people understand this crazy world. So we talked with our videographer, a guy named Caleb. Caleb said, yeah, I think we could do something here. Spent a couple days thinking about the style of the video, that it needed to be very low fidelity so that it seemed authentic, all of this. And then spent a couple days cranking it out. And I still remember vividly one morning, they stopped me in the hallway and they said, we just created this video, we want to post it, um, can we run it by you? This is what I saw. This is a doggo. A small doggo is a pupper. Here's a sad pupper. But a big old pupper, that's actually a doggo. Not to be confused with a big old doggo, because that's a woofer. But if it's just a small woofer, then it's actually a doggo. And do not pet a snip snap doggo. Sometimes a pupper is a real small pupper, and that's a yapper. But then it grows up to be a big old yapper, and that's a pupper. Now a big old woofer is no longer a woofer, it's a floofer. If it eats a humans, then it's a grizzlord. Stay away. A floofer won't eat a humans, and a small floofer is just a woofer. Duh. There are many, many doggo species, like common doggo, also known as doge. Special doggo is rare and very special. Other doggos could be a wrinkler, or a corgo, or a shoob, or a long doggo, or a puggo, or a party puggo. Doggos do things. A doggo in the water is an aqua doggo. A woofer in the water is a subwoofer. Lots of bork bork snarl makes for a heckin' angry woofer. A doggo in a costume is bamboozled. Sometimes they're doing me a frighten. This is Trash Boy. This is doggos making puppers. This is a very fast doggo running at incredible high speed. Diagram your doggos and anything else with lucid chart. Okay, so I'm standing at, the, you know, at a side table in this hallway watching this video, and I gotta tell you, Randy dogs were not in our brand guide. Uh, it's not something that we had considered. Most of this was, like, uh, okay, it seems like it could work, I don't know. Uh, so we decided, again, culture of experimentation, let's put it out there and see what happens. Our goal with this was basically, let's just see what happens. Had we hit 50,000 views, we would have been completely and utterly shocked. Caleb, the, the creator of this, left um, hours after we posted it to go hiking in Canada. And over the weekend, his phone got lit up as we hit 33 million views. Right? We had, we had hit a vein. And it was just, it was spreading like crazy. Those 33 million views, we hadn't spent a cent to get the word out about it, right? So then the question was, what do we do next? Is this replicable? And honestly, we were very, very skeptical that we could, uh, that we could do anything more with it. So you know, there was this idea of, is there a way to stamp this out? So again, we stepped back and said, what was the recipe that seemed to work here? And we did a bunch of experimentation. So we started doing a, a bunch of different things for different memes, mostly in the animal kingdom, and they all performed very well. Not at that 33 million in every case, but they performed very well. So then we said, well, what if we start doing other things and start explaining other aspects of the internet? And you know, we, so we did Fortnite and Star Wars. Fortnite did fabulously. Star Wars, for some crazy reason, did not. We don't know why. But uh, you know, we started experimenting there. Punchline here. Uh, this, I put these slides together a few weeks ago. We are many millions beyond this. The campaign so far has had, we're right now at about 250 million views, and we have spent $100,000. Um, all because we were willing to just experiment with something a little bit crazy. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go out and you start creating uh, videos about doggos, but I am suggesting that there are times where you need to look at your brand guide, you need to look at the way that you're doing things and say, let's try it, let's see what happens. Because for us, what was just this harebrained idea has turned into something pretty massive. Last year we got written up um, in both Ad Week and Ad Age. As I mentioned, this got, uh, it was called the only ad campaign that truly mattered in 2018. And it was done on an absolutely shoestring budget. We continue to evolve it. We've got all sorts of other plans. You'll have to watch and see what comes next. Our mo uh, the most recent one was explaining what is a sandwich. Um, what is a hot dog, by the way? Is a hot dog a sandwich? You're gonna have to watch this, but it turns out a hot dog is a taco. 
Um, you're going to have to check this out. There are rules for these things um, according to the internet. So uh, hop online, go to our YouTube channel, and you can find out why a hot dog's a taco. But the main thing, going all the way back, experimentation is absolutely vital in marketing. As I started, we've all learned things over the course of our careers. But much of what we have learned, we haven't applied in the specific circumstance that we're in today. And so we have to experiment with new ways of doing things. And just try. Some of them are iterative. Some of them can be huge. But having that culture of experimentation is absolutely vital. So with that, we've got some time for questions. There are going to be people on either side um, that can, they'll watch for you and bring you a mic and happy to talk about whatever you've got questions about. Hey, is this on? All right. Uh, so I, I work at Vivint Smart Home. We do not have a culture of experimentation. We do some testing, very minimally. Uh, what, what, what could you tell me that I could take to my leadership that could convince them to create a, a culture of experimentation? Uh, a, and then B, what does your team look like? How is it set up? Like, how many people are on the, on the testing team? Who's involved? And, uh, and what does like, buy-in look like? Sounds good. <clears throat> Let me start with the second part, and then we'll go to the first part. Um, as we look at the team, we have some dedicated experimenters. We call it our growth team. But uh, it's actually something that we do across the team. Early on, something that the Lucidchart team did that I think was super smart is that we took those growth engineers and we dedicated them to this project. Right? We weren't out begging for resources for, from the engineering team. These were people that were absolutely dedicated to running experiments. Um, so that team is about six people. Um, the engineering team, and then we have product managers that are, are responsible uh, as well. To your point around how do you convince someone to go after this, um, last year our growth experimentation was responsible for rough and tough 10% um, of our revenue. Uh, so a 10% lift in revenue last year. Uh, through a bunch of these experiments. And so you know, it really is, it's the sort of thing that if you're not doing experimentation, likely you're leaving money on the table. Any follow-up questions on that one? No, that was perfect. Thank okay. What was like the mix of those views across like what channels? A lot, a lot of that Reddit and YouTube and Facebook, how do you guys contribute all the, where do they come from? So they are mostly Facebook and Instagram. Um, we get picked up frequently by 9gag. Um, this was kind of fun. So you're familiar with 9gag? You know, they, they basically are a, a meme generator or meme distributor. They picked them up and um, early on in those 33 million, uh, we found that they got picked up by a, a variety of sites and they would chop off the outro at the end that said, um, you know, lucid chart and people took them to task. So you had the community that there was this groundswell of the community calling them out on the fact that they had chopped off our brand. And so uh, something 9gag typically won't do branded content, but they, they've been pushing them out. But they're mostly Facebook and Instagram. We now will boost them on Facebook, um, but uh, we only boost them if we pay just a marginal, marginal amount to do it. That's great. So there's strong correlation to, of like your free users and converting them that came from this, these campaigns. You can just see the inbound uh, signups and stuff that they, they, they find their way back to Lucid, a lot of them. I, mean, I would love to say yes. I, I'm going to be completely candid here. We don't really know because most of these are on mobile and very few people sign up for our product on mobile. And so there's a pretty big hop. Uh, where they'll go in, they'll see it on mobile, and then they'll come to lucidchart.com. And we just have enough traffic on the site that it's hard to, to see some which, sort of correlation. That, huh? that being said, though, we, have, we frequently have conversations um, with people where they, they'll tell us that our team was just watching it and decided we all have to shift to, to lucidchart. One last question, sorry. How, how have you brought this into your own uh, lucidchart, like Instagram page? Do you, have you found that you've, it's on brand now to post your own content, making these charts and stuff. And has it become part of like the, the brand's owned, owned and operated channels? 
it, it, is, uh, it has made our Instagram channel a little bit challenging in that, as you can imagine, of those views, many, many of them are 14 to 22 year olds. Yeah. And so when we post something that is more business focused on our Instagram channel, we get things like, we want more doggos as the comments, yeah. or why wasn't I bamboozled, or yes. okay. like, I, this is a great code cam uh, campaign, but I really want to know more about tacos. It, it really is just, we have basically had to treat our Instagram channel now as primarily a way of uh, distributing uh, this sort of content. Really? Yes. To make another one too. I mean, there's yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I just really want to know if you guys have gotten John Hodgman involved in this whole taco hot dog sandwich conversation. Not yet. The, you not let me the, know when that happens, though, because that's going to be amazing. We, we will. Well, so, this, so really fast. This was kind of fun. Um, we had uh, there's there some kid in Japan that posted one of these videos about snacks a while ago, and so you know it's about verbiage for snakes. And he had something like 90 followers. Somehow, though, it started, uh, so this was on Twitter, uh, starts taking off, and Ben Shapiro uh, retweets it. And before we know it, it's lit up across like, all, of the, uh, all of the media. Like, so you know, Forbes editors and all of these people that we've been trying to get in touch with are starting to like our content. So I don't know. We'll have to watch and see if Hodgman, uh, if it gets to him one way or another. Other questions? Yes. How are you aggregating all the different views across the, the platform? Because I imagine you're, you're counting the views that like 9gag had on a video and anyone else who's posted that. So how are you aggregating that information? We're doing it manually. Um, so we, we watch pretty carefully. That's where the estimate that we have there is probably off by many millions because we will frequently find that someone reposted it and it has you know, 5 million views that we hadn't even seen. Yes. Uh, Alex MacArthur, former CMO of Purple. As of two weeks ago, I'm homeless, have no job. Um, uh, we met a couple we weeks did. ago. We did. It's good to office, see you again. So good to see you again. Um, big believer in video as well. Um, Purple had a lot of wins with that uh, as well. But one thing that was really interesting to me was how our brand lift studies looked prior to running a campaign like this. I would be so intrigued to hear if you have any insights from the studies that you guys ran and, and what kind of, uh, how, how different your brand was received post a campaign like that. We are, we are just doing our first real brand lift study this, uh, in Q2. Um, again, part of our challenge is that even with these sorts of numbers, they don't have, we have so much traffic to the site as it is that it's a, it's a marginal increase. And so um, you know, we've got to do a pretty broad brand lift study to understand whether or not we're actually seeing um, you know, significant uptick from this. Um, candidly, a big part of the way that we justify the ROI on this one is it's so cheap, why not? Um, now we're moving into, let's get a bit more uh, scientific about it. Over. Um, I believe that you refer to your team as the growth team, and I was wondering how you go about setting quarterly and annual goals that, in a way that fosters risk-taking and experimentation, and have you ever seen the experimentation keep your team from hitting their goals, and how do you handle that? Really good question. So we use the OKR framework. So Carl, who's the CEO of Lucid, uh, came from Google, uh, early days at Google, where you know, they, they used OKRs. And so we've got this, this idea that you set crazy goals that might be really hard to, to hit. So for instance, for the, um, for the video team, they did that one video at 33 million. So we set the goal for the next year at 100 million. And we all thought that that was going to be near, nearly unachievable, but was something that we wanted to stretch for. They blew past it. Um, but it was, you know, we, we wanted to have, we want to have a culture where you can experiment, where you can push, and where you're not punished for going after a super high goal and missing it. So that's largely what we do is try to set goals that are very aspirational and ensure that people are, you know, given the support if we don't hit all of them. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned ROI as it relates to the videos, is that your primary KPI with your, your marketing message and your media mix? And if so, how does video fit into like the overarching media mix? Uh, so 
so these sorts of videos, again, I'm, I, I should have a better answer than this than I do, but uh, we, we're considering it as just, it's icing on the cake. Most of what we do with our media mix, um, we can tell within 24 hours if it's going to pay off at the ROI that we care about. So we have a very high velocity funnel that we have instrumented very carefully and we understand you know, when we spend this dollar, we'll know our metric internally is it needs to pay off within 12 months or we're not gonna spend it. We then have some of these others that are much harder to track that we're willing to say, you know what, we're gonna consider this as just overall lift. So do you, then do you like run different types of campaigns where one's ROI driven versus one's maybe just brand Brand driven, exactly, yeah. Okay. Most of what we do is uh, very ROI driven. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much, appreciate the time.